AI is dramatically shaking up the programming industry, which is pretty wild for those of us who are career programmers. Many people are saying that AI will eventually completely replace all human programmers. That's certainly the dominant opinion. However, there is a very long road from where we are today to there, and we are all wondering what AI-assisted programming is going to look like in the next few years. What are we going to have to prepare for? How are we going to use our IDEs? How are we going to get around in a code environment? So here are my top five predictions for the next three to five years. My name is Cameron. I'm one of the co-founders of a multi-million dollar software development company. Our 11 team members use AI-assisted coding technology all day, every day. I've also been really carefully following the development roadmap for vibe coding softwares like Cursor and Windsurf just to see how people are using these types of softwares and where things are going to go from here. So these are a few things I think we're going to see happen in the next few years. As with most innovation, I'm guessing they're going to be deployed as like experiments and hyped up. I'm not sure how much adoption they will get, but they're pretty wild concepts and I'm pretty excited to talk about them. All right, prediction number one, agentic AI UX testing. So right now, if you want to do UX testing, like on uh, a particular flow through a software or a particular series of web pages or just the add to cart function on a web page or something like that, it is pretty resource intensive. You can do user testing or focus groups where you have people who are dedicated testers who come in and you give them a little challenge like, hey, try to, you know, add this to your cart, find this item, add it to your cart and check out or like try to sign up for this service or, you know, um, go through this process in the app to set up this thing or whatever. You give them that challenge and then you observe their behavior. You have them make comments along the way, that sort of thing. Um, that obviously is extremely resource intensive because it takes a lot of time to gather all those people, get them to go through the task, parse the results um, and then deploy new um you know a new ux and then retest it all to see if it does if it performs better based on the hypotheses that you identified um, that is a ton of work um, the other way you can do it is like a b testing where you test version a against version b that also takes a lot of time it can take a lot of time to set up the tests because you have to actually create version a create version b identify the metrics that you're going to be going after and run the test during a time period typically we'll run tests like this for you know weeks if not longer to be able to gather enough conversion data to see how things are going so the idea with agentic AI UX testing is basically you would have AI bots that are trained uh, to be as similar as possible in their behaviors and interactions to their human counterparts in a particular demographic. So, you know, you're working on a logistics company website, you might have a bot that tries to behave as much like a, a truck driver as possible, or you have a SaaS for C-suites, you might have you know, try to behave as much like a marketing manager as possible. And so those bots will click around a page and try to interact with it like a human would. And they will try to, you know, they'll have distractions programmed in. So they might like click to another tab or stop browsing or click off or click on the wrong thing, all that sort of thing. So those agentic AI bots could basically come in and test a particular UX um, against a set of metrics. And you can, the advantage of that is you could have lots of them sort of like um, spoofing this human interaction and trying to act like a human, um, and particularly trying to act like a human of a particular demographic in order to really, really speed up UX testing. This is something that I think would be really great because uh, UX testing takes a long time for me right now. Um, prediction number two, parallel agents, parallel code bases. So right now with like Git infrastructure and things like that, you might have different branches that you're kind of working on um, and you'll maybe have different developers working on different branches. Well, I think that, you know, we, we might get to a point where you have entirely parallel code bases for a particular project where these different code bases are like running in tandem. And rather than having different features built in different sets, you might actually have like an entire code base built out relatively quickly that is then compared to another code base. Similar to where ChatGPT will give you answer one and answer two and ask you which response you prefer and then try to modify its behavior based on that. You might get something like that in code bases where if a code base can be spun up really, really fast, why not spin up three different code bases, maybe each using different models, and then 
maybe run it through Agentic AI UX testing and see which version is going to be the most preferable version. So I think you're going to see like these, you know, potentially parallel code bases that are built uh, to deploy under different scenarios. Maybe you deploy them for different demographics and things like that. But I think code bases in terms of like um, SaaS products and things like that, we're going to see way, way, way more code and way more variations of the code than we ever have before. Prediction number three, constant commits. So right now, the way that you work with like a, uh, a repository infrastructure is you'll typically like, you know, check out the branch that you want to work on, you'll work on it. And then when your changes on your local machine are, you know, in a place where you would like to push them back to the repository, you'll write a commit message, you'll push it back to the repository and, um, and there will be your commit. And then other people can go look at that commit, see why you did it. Um, and they can just, you know, make adjustments from there. Well, with AI coding going really fast, and particularly with Agentic AI, um, that might, you know, make a lot of different changes in different parts of the system. That's what a lot of people complain about with like Cursor and Windsurf and stuff like that is like, man, this thing made changes to like 10 of my files. And, um, you know, I'm having a hard time tracking why all those changes happened and what went on and that sort of thing. Um, I think that just committing every time you're done with a segment or a new feature or something like that is not going to be enough commits. I think we're actually going to want to, um, you know, track every single commit, every single thing that was ever done in a code base. And so I could see it getting to the point where version control is way, way, way more granular. And we're actually seeing each identical change as its own like commit that you can search through, parse out, pro con think through um, and go back to um, and then ask the AI to, hey, remember when we were at this point in the code base, why did we do that? Why did we add this? Can we make this interact with this other piece? So I think there's going to be a lot of that like constant committing, sort of this like ABC, always be committing ideology. Um, prediction number four, just in time software. So because software, the speed of creating and deploying software is becoming faster and faster and faster, I could definitely see us getting to a world where software is just built right when you want to use it, right? So for instance, you, you come in and you say, oh man, I have all of this data that I want to parse through from all of these. Let's say you're, you're uh, working on lots of apartment complexes and you say, hey, I want to I want to really quickly scan through my move-in data, my retention data. I want to identify the different regions and how they're doing and all that sort of thing. You might come in with that goal at 9 a.m. And, you know, by 9.30, an AI has built you a piece of software that can do that. And you use it for that purpose. You present your report on it to the leadership on Tuesday afternoon. And that software was only used for that one time for that one purpose. And it's done. I could see this sort of like just in time software where you ask for it for the particular use case that you are um, using right now. It's built, you use it, and then you move on and you, you build another software very quickly the next time you want to do something else. So just in time software. And then prediction five, I think we're seeing this a lot more. Um, this sort of idea of like integrations versus softwares, right? So right now, softwares are very delineated. They're very bucketed in their own sort of world, right? So you have a login for all these different softwares. And when you want to accomplish a particular purpose, you log into this particular software and, uh, and you start using that software and it works the way it works. Well, I think what's going to happen is that we're going to start thinking about things a lot more in terms of integrations rather than softwares, like everything sort of becomes an API. So for instance, if I wanted to know about my fitness data, I want to know how well I'm doing from, from a fitness perspective and how well I'm doing this year versus last year. Well, there's a lot of data that's available in a lot of places for that. Um, there's, you know, my, my Fitbit has, has data that it has been tracking for years, but there's also, I put a little bit of data on Strava for a while when I was, when I was doing some running. Um, I briefly used macro factor, you know, to track some calories and stuff. Um, and there's other data that just is gathered from my geolocation. 
Um, there's a lot of different places that that data is potentially housed. There's even conversations I've had with people. I would really love to be able to come in and get a dashboard of all of those things. And so all of a sudden, all of these things, um, rather than going from like a software where I use like the Fitbit software, Fitbit is sort of like an aggregator of my of a certain type of fitness data connected to my wearable, right? And I can, ideally, I would be able to sort of like tell my prompts uh, you know, I'd be able to prompt what type of software I'd like to be able to view all my fitness data. And then that software just asks Fitbit for permissions to utilize the data that it has. And so I can see like permissioning and um, data utilization and sort of this plug and play sort of integration world where the individual software becomes very unimportant. And all of a sudden these things are thought of a lot more as like integrations or platforms. It's more like a data platform, if that makes sense. So those are my top five predictions. Uh, let me know in the comments what you think. Thanks so much for all your comments on my previous video. I really appreciate it. I'm still working on catching up with all of them, but I uh, appreciate all the dialogue. You guys had so many good things to say. Please like and subscribe, um, and we'll see you next time. Thanks so much.